River sea systems have shaped humanity from the very earliest civilizations. Complex and finely balanced interactions between climate, geology, topography, and the resulting soil and vegetation cover, coupled with marine interactions, control the natural flow of water, sediment, and nutrients. This determines the functioning of river sea systems and the many benefits or ecosystem services they provide. Civilizations have continually attempted to modify these environments to enhance specific services, which has ultimately changed their functioning. Climate change and the increasing occurrence of extreme events, such as flooding and drought, are also having profound impacts, requiring a change in our thinking and the way we manage river sea systems. Danubius RI is a pan-European, multidisciplinary infrastructure designed to deliver new insights and understanding needed to better manage river sea systems for the benefit of all. From a sample of Danubius RI supersites across Europe, Lecture 1 introduces examples of how river sea systems function and their importance to society. We begin in Venice and highlight the balance between society needs and the forces driving change. Danubius is all about transitional areas. It means it's, a, it's about the areas that are in between the river and the sea. Therefore, it is where two uh, different systems meet. And this is always a, a complicated system. The superside is uh, comprised of two different places. One is the Venice Lagoon, the other one is the Po Delta. They are quite different from each other. Um, the Po Delta still receives a lot of uh, water from uh, northern Italy, whereas the Venice Lagoon basically has no uh, water input anymore and uh, it is only influenced by the tide from the Adriatic Sea. And uh, it depends on the water. So, therefore, it is critical to maintain that relation between Venice and the sea. So uh, the lagoon is a, is a delicate environment. It is an, um, a very special equilibrium between uh, forces that make the lagoon always deeper and other lagoons that make them, that make it more shallow. They try to make a swamp out of the lagoon. And depending on what forces are more important, the lagoon is drifting to one or to the other side. 500 years ago, we had the problem that there were too many sediments in the lagoon and the lagoon was becoming basically a swamp and Venice would have become part of the mainland. This was not a good idea, especially for the Venetians. They liked to have Venice as a separate island. They decided to remove all the sediments out of, they, they, uh, they deviated the rivers out of the lagoon. And so therefore they, in a certain way, they saved the lagoon. They made the lagoon as they wanted to have it. We are now here, that's the island of Santa Erasmo. Here you can see how the lagoon has undergone a lot of changes. Here we had the Lido barrier island, here we had Santa Erasmo barrier island, and then Tre Tre Treporti barrier island. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, they built these groins out here. And so basically they transformed what was before part of the sea, they transformed it into a lagoon now. This has the sand that has accumulated. Basically it's a natural protection that sits in between the, uh, the sea and the lagoon. Quite delicate. Um, if some of this uh, equilibrium, this dynamic equilibrium, uh, breaks down then also the barrier islands are in danger and the, the fate of the lagoon depends on these barrier islands. If you don't do anything, I mean, the lagoon will tend to a certain equilibrium. It might not be the equilibrium we, we want as the people who are living in there. So one of the equilibrium with climate change would be that uh, Venice would, would be continuously flooded probably. Yeah? And uh, therefore uh, people would not be able to live in Venice anymore. So if we want to still have people and 
tourists to come to Venice, we, st we have to do something. From the Venice Lagoon, we move to a transboundary system, the Elba River, and consider its natural functioning and the challenges of balancing the delivery of ecosystem services and environmental protection. The Elba River is about the third largest river in Europe. It's a little bit longer than 1,000 kilometers. The super site covers only a part of it. It covers the tidal part of the river in the, in the lowland part and uh, the German Bight in the North Sea. We are here now on the Elbe River. It's about uh, 150,000 square kilometers big and it harbors lots of different or major cities in its catchment. For example, Prague in the Czech Republic and then Dresden um, and Leipzig in Germany, but also Berlin on one of the major tributaries and then Hamburg where we are now. So in total more than uh, 25 million people are living in the catchment. But what is really impressive that the Elbe drains more than half of the area of the Czech Republic and more than a quarter of the area of Germany. There are several important and interesting points along the Elbe North Sea Superside which are important for the functioning of the system itself. So one part is the freshwater part upstream of the Wiengesacht Tesperhude, it's called. Then the Wiengesacht itself, which marks the beginning of the Elbe estuary. Then we have the whole port region of Hamburg, where we have a lot of turnover of matter. And then we are already going towards the coastal area into the North Sea. And along there we have the stretches of the Wadden Sea, which are very unique. And then you get the offshore North Sea, which is also very different in terms of the cycling of matter. Here we're standing very close to the beginning of the estuarine part of the, of the Elbe. And it is a very important nutrient source to the German Bight. And most of this nitrate and nutrients in general stems from agriculture because the densely populated catchment area has a lot of agriculture and a lot of cities and urban areas that just discharge a lot of nitrate into the river. Rivers and estuaries in general have an important filter function for the coastal zone because natural estuaries remove a lot of the nutrients before they reach the coastal ocean. One of the important factors there actually is water residence time. The water goes in, stays there for a longer time. All microbes and other organisms have a lot of time to feed on the nutrients, sediments can settle down, and then the water will move away again. In an anthropogenic estuary like the Elbe, this is not going to happen, at least not to that extent because we have dredging. Dredging removes a lot of the sediments that might be active sites of nutrient cycling. And the estuary is also diked, so the residence time is much shorter, the water is flushed through. But of course, that um, reduces the filter function of the estuary. The challenge is to harmonize, to keep the river water in a good quality, also for the agriculture, but also at the same time to allow the uh, waterborne transport and related business in, in the city, because this brings economical activity and also uh, jobs for the city. So this is, is, is a big challenge to, to balance environmental protection and uh, sustainable use. From the Alba, we travel to another megacity, London, and consider the functioning of the Thames and how the macrotidal system interacts with a very high population density. The Thames super site is situated here in southeast England. It is home to Britain's second longest river, and where this meets the North Sea, it forms one of Britain's largest macrotidal estuaries. The River Thames which is the dominant freshwater input to the estuary, is approximately 350 kilometers long 
and it drains a catchment area of 13,000 kilometres squared. The Riverine part of the Thames has been the focal area for much research at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology since the mid-1990s, which has focused on monitoring nutrients, sediments, chlorophyll and metals in the system. However, in recent years, there has been a change in emphasis to focus on some of the emerging environmental problems, which cover things like microplastics in the system, algal blooms, pharmaceuticals and antimicrobial resistance. And this has adopted the use of state-of-the-art sensors and earth observation. Danubius will extend this to the whole river sea system by including an emphasis on the estuarine areas. At the moment we're right beside the, the River Thames and it's uh, close to, to high tide. The tidal range here is about six metres. And when we were filming earlier on a, uh, on a beach um, to further downstream, the, uh, the, the river level would have been about five metres or so lower than it is now. One of the difficulties we have with a system like the, um, the River Thames is that it's very much at the interface between the, the fresh water and the marine environments. And so we have a, a catchment upstream that's what we call a, a permeable catchment with underlying chalk, where the waters can take as much as long as 60 years to pass through the catchment from the point at which rainfall falls to the point at which it recharges the groundwater table and then that groundwater moves through to seep through to the river and then ultimately flow through um, past the Houses of Parliament here and out to the Thames Estuary. The population of the Thames catchment exceeds 13 million and population densities are extremely high, particularly in the lower reaches of the river and estuary areas where the mega city of London has developed. And if we think back in time, for much of the 19th century, London was actually the largest city in the world. The Thames supersite has been modified in many ways by humans over time and many of these modifications affect the functioning of this river sea system. For example, to ensure a reliable water supply, water is both abstracted and augmented from many parts of the system, and this affects the flows we see today. Embankments are also put in place, not only to protect areas from floods, but also to reclaim and protect areas of grazing land, particularly in the estuarine parts of the system. Along the whole river system and estuary, there are wastewater systems which deliver pollutants. Although there are clearly many pressures on the River Thames system that we see here, it remains an invaluable resource and still delivers many ecosystem services. Danubius RI includes the Tay catchment supersite, which provides an important contrasting example of a relatively unimpacted river sea system. Home to Scotland's longest river, the Tay Supersite catchment comprises a substantial area of Scotland with a very diverse range of climate, ecology and geology. At its core is the River Tay, which stretches eastwards some 193 kilometres from its source at Ben Lui in the west into the Firth of Tay in the east. The River Tay epitomises the adaptability and resilience of an essential and diverse river sea system. From the high hills around Craylarrick, drawing from a vast catchment of approximately 5,000 kilometres squared, the Tay is witness to agriculture, fishing and forestry. Its power is harnessed by hydro schemes, new and old, and its banks are circumnavigated by roads and urban developments. Lower downstream, the Tay gives rise to some of Scotland's most fertile and high-value arable farmland that has worked intensively for food production. Open hillsides give way to hamlets, villages and towns before the Tay finally arrives in Perth, the first of the two cities along with Dundee downstream. After Perth, it begins to mix with salt water before winding its way past vast reed beds to reach the city of Dundee the Tay Estuary and ultimately out into the North Sea and beyond.
The Tay estuary is recognised as one of the least developed and least polluted estuaries in Europe and can be regarded as a benchmark for sustainability. Careful management and an integrated approach to draw together the myriad of initiatives aiming to promote the region's cultural, economic and environmental importance has ensured conflicting demands to support wildlife, leisure and tourism, as well as a catchment of over half a million people and over 15,000 businesses are well balanced. Challenges, however, remain, not least threats from diffuse pollution and soil erosion within the catchment, flooding and coastal erosion due to relative sea level rise, and how the system will adapt to climate change. A long history of shared knowledge and research on the Tay supersite and an ongoing commitment to monitor and assess important environmental impacts will thus be vital to ensure sustainability of this vital river sea system. From one of the smallest catchments in Danubius RI, we move to the Danube Delta, the interface between Europe's most international river and the Black Sea, and consider the functioning of the delta, the impacts we are having on it, and the need to understand river sea delta evolution. The Danube Delta is the largest protected wetland in the European Union. It has 6,000 square kilometers in Romania and about half that size on the territory of the Ukraine. It is almost the most pristine, as close as natural state. It's a hotspot of biodiversity, even though it receives the waters from one third of Europe. The Danube Delta is also an area where human intervention started to be felt already by the mid-19th century. The purpose was to open the Danube area and the Black Sea to international navigation and trade. So already in the second half of the 19th century, the middle arm of the Danube Delta, the arm of Sulina, was selected from the, for navigation. The natural meanders were cut and canals allowed the water to go faster from the Danube to the Black Sea and have an almost straight line canal that would take ships upstream and downstream. We are on Svantu Gheorghe branch, so this is the southernmost branch of the Danube Delta and in a place which was significantly altered by humans, if you, if you don't see that. So it looks like everything around here is natural, but it isn't. So on one side we have a canal that connects the Danube Delta to the Razel and Sinoia Lagoon system, so that canal was cut by humans a bit more than a hundred years ago with a huge impact on nature. Why? Because that canal took the Danube waters with everything they carried in them to this lagoon and completely changed the chemical composition of the lagoon. This was one of the richest parts of the Black Sea in fish stocks and biodiversity and because of the Danube waters and eutrophication phenomena everything changed so the fish stocks are decreasing dramatically and we're now trying to understand all these complex processes and see if we cannot reconnect the lagoon to the Black Sea. We realize that we do not fully understand all the processes occurring here. Uh, why is the Danube Delta supersite important? Uh, well, because if you can find answers to some scientific questions here, you can test them in other parts of the world, but it's like a strong step forward to understand river Delta Sea evolution. From just a few examples of the Danubius research infrastructure, 
We have introduced a range of issues and challenges related to both impacted and relatively unimpacted river sea systems. Lecture 2 will examine the various ecosystem services provided by river sea systems, how these can end up conflicting with each other, and provide examples of nature-based management options in both headwaters and coastal environments. <laughs>